On today's Johnny Massacre show, Kanye West has a new album out. I'll be giving you my thoughts on that. Also, Terminator Dark Fate, the movie, is failing. In other news, a wicked gangster movie is coming out called The Irishman. Russians hate the new Call of Duty game. And we talk a little bit about my life. So here we are. Kanye West has a new album out. I'm sure you've heard about it. Whenever Kanye West has something to say, the news goes crazy for it. He's He's got a headline in him, does Kanye. He's very controversial, especially since he started wearing his MAGA hat. That's made most of the media at large, which is all very left-leaning, hate Kanye West. So you can tell a newspaper or a news website's political allegiance when they start talking about Kanye West and calling him problematic and hateful for wearing the Trump hat. If you ask me, there is nothing more hateful than discriminating discriminating, excuse me, discriminating against someone just on the basis of their political beliefs. Oh, you support this president? Fuck you, you're a piece of shit. What is more discriminatory than that? This is the current culture of gaslighting where people accuse you of being crazy when actually you are the same one. Kanye West is right in his political leanings. He's allowed to be a Republican and a black man. Unfortunately, the media say if you are black, you have to be a Democrat, which is very fucking racist. How dare you say someone should think a certain way because of your skin color? Anyway, these are all the kind of crazy controversial things that come to mind when we think of Kanye West. So in light of his latest news, which is gathering all the headlines, which is he has a new album out, a gospel religious album called Jesus is King. He's getting a lot of negative publicity. The album has got a five out of 10 average rating on Metacritic. And I'm here to tell you the truth about the album. And let me bring you over to the album now on my iTunes. Have a look at my screen. So here it is. This is Kanye West's new album. I believe it's going to hit number one in America on their charts, which is known as the Billboard 200. And I quite like the artwork. I've got to say, I like the simple design. It's a bright blue a royal blue 12 inch vinyl and that just doesn't that look beautiful you can just about make out the name of the album jesus is king on the record and let me kind of explain to you about this album so kanye west had a really fucking good run with his first four albums i believe i think his fourth one was his magnum opus which is his best work which was i think it was called my beautiful dark twisted fantasy and that got 10 out of 10 ratings across the board. And that was before people went politically insane when Trump got to power and started draining the swamp, so to speak, not being bullied by the media and the deep state and whatnot. Uh, after which they all kind of piled in on him and tried to demonize him and remove him from his presidency in a very undemocratic, totalitarian fashion. Before all of that happened, Kanye West was um, looked upon much more fondly by the media. But... It's difficult to really know if the media are sincere when they say the album isn't that good because they might be biased because of Kanye's political leanings. And so I have listened to this album and I'll tell you my thoughts on it. After the fourth Kanye West album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, which was his magnum opus, as I said, I think he released three more. One was called Yeezus, which was a very industrial kind of distorted album. Quite difficult to listen to, but... It's interesting because most artists of his caliber and his level start to sell out when they make as much money as he does because they just want to maintain their position. But that album was a very brave move, a very rebellious move. It was not commercial at all. And so it shows you that Kanye West, unlike his contemporaries like Jay-Z, Kanye West is his own man. He's a free thinker. He does what he wants. Then after that, I think we had an album called The Life of Pablo which was kind of fucking weird. That's when Kanye West started to go on these crazy political Twitter rants. And the album was not very cohesive. It seemed as if Kanye was just doing whatever the fuck he wanted and not trying to tailor it to the market at all. I said before, it's good that he's being an individual, but I think even if you're an individual, you still have to be smart and strategic and you have to at least put a few tracks on there and make the album cohesive enough to appeal to the mainstream and just make people love it. And I think that album was a bit like, what? Then after that, he had an album called Ye. Now this is when Kanye started to go a bit too far up his ass, if you ask me. All the tracks were about two minutes long. 
and there was no cohesiveness at all. On the one hand, I think you've got to respect the, the absolute outrageous outlandishness of that. This guy who's got all the world's eyes and ears directed in his direction, for want of a better word, are expecting him to deliver, to deliver. He's on the world stage. This is his new product. And he just doesn't give a fuck. He puts whatever the fuck he likes on there. So uh, if you look at it from that perspective, I think that's quite admirable. That's quite brave. But then on the other hand, you have to just think about the average listener who's going to pick it up. You want them to be able to connect to what you're doing. You're trying to communicate with them. Don't try to alienate them. So that album with music that was way too short and not very cohesive, I don't think people had that on repeat. And now that brings us neatly to Jesus is King, his latest album and the opening of the Johnny Massacre show today. Now, I'm sorry to say that like the previous two albums, Ye and Life of Pablo, I think it's called Life of Pablo. All the tracks are really fucking short. Have a look at my iTunes right now. So track one, minute and a half, track two, two minutes, 44. I'll just keep reading the track lengths 1 minute 44 2 minutes 31 2 minutes 16 1 minute 56 248 323 323 333 oh is there some kind of hidden meaning there and then 49 seconds so it seems as if the, the average track length is under three minutes and again it goes back to your perspective on this on the one hand i think it's cool that kanye west doesn't give a fuck it's art he does what he wants, even though he's signed to a major record label and there's pressure to deliver to these millions of fans. He just does exactly what he wants to do. And I think that's cool. But on the other hand, when have you ever had a favorite movie that's about like 40 minutes long? Your favorite movie is always going to be lengthy. Your favorite song, how many of your favorite songs are around two minutes long? The only songs that are amazing that are two minutes long are basically by the Beatles. And they're a bunch of freaks. You'll never get a band like the Beatles again. Let's not even go into that. They're absolutely perfect in every way, in my opinion. So unless you're the Beatles, I don't think you're going to get away with making two minute tracks. So, I mean, you want to enjoy the music. You want it to be around a bit longer. And that's disappointing. So for me, so my personal take on it is I wish some of these songs were a little bit longer. Now, the first two songs, if you have a look at my screen, Every hour is number one, and the second one is seller, whatever, whatever the hell that means. So these first two tracks are very much gospel, lots of shouty black female choirs, and I love the sound of gospel, but it's a bit a bit shocking, a bit of a, a bit of a jerk into Kanye West world. You, you, you don't feel there's any smooth transition. You just feel these people are shouting this gospel at you and it's all right it's a bit intense i have to admit i was a bit worried when i listened to the first two tunes there but then as the next tracks come in this is where the vintage kanye comes in so i'd say tracks three four five six seven eight and nine and ten so most of the album 70 percent of the album is basically vintage Kanye West. He's using old school soul samples and he's using obscure samples from various music from around the world. And he has the repetitive soul samples coming in. And it, it you know, Kanye West still has that continuity ever since his first album. Some of the mixing and the beats in this are fucking outstandingly good from a, a geeky perspective, from a music producer perspective technical perspective a mixing perspective a mastering perspective they sound incredibly good they're so clean and so juicy and just oh man the level of production is orgasmic now here comes my next gripe i was reading some comments online and apparently there have been millions of different versions of all these tracks and the average person like me isn't privy to any of this shit that's going on but the the real hardcore Kanye fans, of which you can find them on Reddit, there's a whole thread about this. They've been listening to and reacting to and commenting on various versions of these tracks. And it seems as if there were versions with a lot of drums and Kanye West has taken the drums off a bunch of tracks. What the fuck, man? This is kind of supposed to be hip hop, right? Definitely it's hip hop vibes. It's Kanye hip hop vibes, but there's no drums in it. 
And to make things even stranger, there are tracks where there's no drums the whole way through and then right at the end for about 30 seconds, the beat comes in and it is knockout. It is fucking knockout. Look at this track over here, track 10. I think it's track, yeah, it is track 10 featuring Clips, the Virginia duo who you haven't heard together on a record for a long time. That track is fucking wicked. And at the end, this beat comes in and it's just groovy and knocking and clean and just, ah, oh, it's perfect. But it's only for 30 seconds. And I just can't help but see this as a little bit of a missed opportunity. If Kanye had just put the beats on this album, had the beats flowing and cracking and just made it structured, like he's always done. It's not like he can't do it. Make it structured, arrange it well, have a nice three, four, five minute arrangement with those knocking beats. It would have been banging. It could have been a classic. And you could have reached more people with it. But as it stands, I don't understand how these tracks are going to blow up on streaming or radio or wherever, just globally, because there's not enough beats in it. But that said, I like the album. I put it on and I'm confident I'm going to be entertained. You've got the gospel vibes and you've got the vintage Kanye. And when the drums come in, it's really good. It's not really what I expected in terms of gospel. I thought it was going to be a little bit more accessible, but it's it's put to that twisted Kanye filter. I don't know what plane this guy's operating on, but that's how it sounds. Speaking of planes, the carpool karaoke, that really gimmicky modern way of promoting your music where this like fat English guy talks to you and you sing or rap. Kanye West did that on a plane and he got a plane. It was like all black people and they're all singing gospel. And that was amazing. Like it, it nearly brought me to tears, man. Gospel is so soulful and meaningful. And when it's like a dozen or 30, 40, 50 people all singing together, it's amazing. And I wish some of that vibe in the carpool karaoke was on the album. That was much more accessible. And another thing I want to say, I think I like Kanye West's political stance as a black Republican because his stance is so much more inviting. Is it not? So... In his stance, he's on a plane, it's full of black people. And Kanye West, he he's obviously, if you're going to have all black people on a plane, that's not obviously the most diverse thing. Kanye West is obviously supporting black people, whatever that means in today's climate, and supporting black culture. And Kanye West, he says, you can think whatever you want. And he says, the most racist thing you can do is say that someone thinks a certain way because of their skin color. And he said that sticking up for white people because white people seem to be enemy number one straight white male in the media at the moment. And that message is so much more appealing than the other side, Kanye West rivals. If you're gonna promote black culture and all this and that, and you do it in a respectful way, then everyone, regardless of what skin color they have, is gonna be receptive to it. But on the other side of the aisle, it's like white people are trash and white people are oppressors and black people are oppressed and you've done this to them and your generation did it and you should pay for it and you should feel guilty and you're a piece of shit. Who's gonna be accepting to that? If you do that, you're actually gonna make more people racist. You're gonna make, for example, white people look at black people and, th and think, oh, something's not right here, or like, this is all political and I don't trust this. Can't we all just be proud of our skin color, be proud to be white, be proud to be black, and revel in our culture, promote our culture respectfully and kindly with the intent of just bringing people together, which is what Kanye West did. So I think, rambling a bit now, but, this album does have political tinges to it. Kanye West doesn't go completely political, which is a wise move because too much politics don't mix with entertainment. But um, there's a political message in this album and it's obviously leaning towards the right, the Republican side of things. And I think Kanye West's heart is in the right place with this album. It's very spiritual, it's very meaningful. For the first time in a while, we've heard Kanye West get away from all this nihilistic, materialistic shit. And I think the world kind of needs this right now. I think we're having a spiritual crisis. And I think that that's why people are doing all this crazy shit. They're, they've got false idols, false gods on Instagram and social media. And Kanye West is, is looking on the inside and he's looking for something a bit more meaningful than what the average person is consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. So all in all, Excuse me, I think this album is a little bit, it's not its best and maybe a, a little bit forgettable, but it's good, it's entertaining. And to all the people slating it, in small sections, is some of Kanye West's best beats for years. This guy has still got it. And I'm just hoping for his next album, he makes it a little bit more accessible 
and a little bit longer and just arranges it in a more traditional format for everyone to consume. So, yep, Kanye West's new album, Jesus is King, is out now. Make sure to stream it and have a listen to it because it is it's pretty decent. Now, in other news today, Terminator, the new Terminator film's out. Now, because I live in Japan, they release films later than the rest of the world. Actually, there is no country that releases films later than Japan because they're retarded in that regard when it comes to cinema. What can I say? It's just true. Sort it out, guys. So Terminator, amazing film. Terminator 1 and 2, some of the most influential science fiction films ever made. You already know this. We don't need to go over this old ground again. But whenever a new Terminator film comes out, people are interested. There's a lot of old fans and then there's a lot of new fans as well. People who, looking back through cinema, trying to find some of the good films, will inevitably come across the Terminator movies. And Terminator Dark Fate, the latest movie, appears to be failing. And I can't say I'm surprised because I saw the trailer and the whole thing is just off. The original Terminator movie is dark, neo-noir science fiction. Their second film, some of the best, cleverest special effects you've ever seen, a hybrid of CGI and real effects where you often can't tell where they transition. The lighting is quite dark so it has to kind of paper over the cracks unlike today where the CGI is just out under office lights and it's kind of exposed for its um, lack of depth. The original CGI King, Terminator 2, still reigns supreme. And those films were dark and they were cool. They were fucking cool. Arnold in his fucking leather and his shotgun, he would reload it by spinning it on his fucking hand, blowing shit away. So much cool shit. What is cool about this film? Not a whole lot. You look at it, it looks bland, it looks pallid, it looks too shiny. There's a, there's a thin veneer of sickly sweet Hollywood gloss all over it. And it just doesn't look cool or edgy at all. And a lot of people are saying it's been infected with social justice ideology and it looks like it might have been. So Terminator Dark Fate appears to be failing let me draw your attention to the metacritic so metacritic actually means fuck all because now reviewers seem to mark down movies music if it's not political you people are fucking wankers basically because life is about reality just be real criticize the movie for what it is not for a lack of a political message you really are gonna be the social justice warrior and try to enhance your social standing by looking like a good person, by saying there aren't enough good politics in this movie. Fuck off, no one cares about your political opinion. So my point is you can't trust Metacritic. But anyways, let's go over to this hellhole anyways. Here it is, Terminator Dark Fate 54. But really what I wanna show you is the Wikipedia. So the budget of this film, 185 million, which is fucking massive. The one before this, Terminator Genesis, was so bad that had a huge budget and it barely broke even so the fact this has such a huge budget i can't quite understand why they're taking such a big risk and considering they are you'd have thought they would have at least made it cool couldn't you give it to a producer who made a film cool obviously not budget 185 mil let's go down we got the first little trickle of information about how much money it's making is gross and you can see here Wikipedia says in the United States and Canada, Terminator Dark Fate will be released alongside blah, 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 and is projected to gross 40 to 47 million from 4,000 theaters in its opening weekend. In Germany, the film started out with 132,500 spectators, placing it in third on that week's charts. Third, a franchise like Terminator coming in third. In the weekend following its international debut, the film grossed 12.8 million from countries in Europe and Asia, considered a low start. So that is not good news for Terminator. And who can be surprised? Look, they should give me a call when they're making these fucking films, right? I'd just bowl in there. I'd be like, no, 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 maybe, yes, no. Get that shit out of there. Change this shitty lighting. This isn't a fucking pantomime, mate. Let's get some dark lighting. Do you remember the T2 had a, this weird kind of blue tone? I believe that was called James Cameron Blue in reference to the director's choice of colour scheme. That kind of blue noir shade really helped build the atmosphere. I would make sure they put that in the film. Also, the Terminator movies were like fucking horror movies. It was like Jason Voorhees coming after you, but a robot instead of some weird ghostly goon. That's what it was. It was a horror movie. 
and it was a sci-fi horror. Where's the horror? Where's that shit? And where's that bombastic, explosive, wicked shit? All I see is a bunch of pansy, brightly lit bullshit. Enough with that. So I might, I might go and see it just to rip it apart for you. And I'll do it just because I love ripping shit apart. I'm not going to get many hits because the movies will already have been out. You will already have seen it. The buzz will have died by the time I get to see it in Japan. But I will probably go and check that out. Interestingly, I went over to one of the most ideologically brainwashed, biased newspapers in the universe, The Guardian, just to kind of read about it. Because when you read a social justice style left wing news outlet and their opinion on a movie, you, it gives you a really good idea of how shit the film is. If they're praising its social justice elements, you know the film's gonna be terrible. So let's read what a social justice newspaper, the Brit Britain's The Guardian, sorry for that, you know, it's from my country. Let's read Britain's The Guardian's opinion about Terminator. So come on over to my screen, ladies and gents. Let's read the last two paragraphs. The Guardian says, what seems certain is that he and Connor are no longer at the heart of Terminator's future. In every Terminator movie since the original, it has been Skynet's intention to defeat the male leader of the post-apocalypse human resistance. But in Dark Fate, it is a young woman, Danny, who everyone is trying to murder or protect from the evil robot oppressors. So they're basically saying that Terminator movies have been about killing a male leader of an army. But now it's about a woman and they're saying that proudly. So firstly, no woman is going to lead an army against a, a fucking huge sea of murderous cybernetic killers. It's going to be a man jacked with testosterone who fucking loves killing. That said, you still can have women in those roles. Sarah Connor in the original two Terminators was a fucking amazing hard as nails character. And she was woman, a woman, but what made her interesting is she had the classical female traits. She was maternal, she was caring, she was emotional. She's always panicking. Unlike the logical, rational Kyle Reese of the first movie, who kind of held her together. And that's where movies work, when they reflect real life, because you relate to it, okay? So, what I'm saying is here, to criticize the previous movies for not having a woman just because it's a woman is incredibly sexist. You wanna have a woman in there just because she's female, well then I can say, well, men should work everywhere and have all the jobs just because we're men. It doesn't make sense. I hate this ideological way of thinking. That's the true sexism. These people on the far left, all they do is see everything by race, sex, and gender. And they divide everything up into oppressor versus oppressed. And they say women are oppressed, black people are oppressed, minorities are oppressed, white people aren't. And then they want to stoke up this conflict to basically get people onto their side, solidify a base, make people just sink into groupthink and vote for a liberal president. That's the whole reason they do this. It's just part of their ideology. And it's basically neo-Marxist thinking. You should read... Marx's communist manifesto if you want to understand this way of thinking yes that's right newspapers like this and the mainstream media at large are indulging in quasi-communist ideology and I just don't know fucking why and it's evident in this paper so let's go back to this article it says that if the fact that you know female is 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 one of the lead roles here if that's bothering the trolls and there are hints in this latest trailer that danny may be the mother of the future resistance leader rather than the leader herself then surely it holds out some hope for the rest of us okay so this paper you know trying to be a good guy or a good girl or whatever you want to call it a good thing is saying that yeah if it if this pisses off the men then good who is being the asshole here? Who is being the antagonistic wanker? I just want to watch a good film. I want to watch a good film that's relatable. That's all, where I can suspend my disbelief through some characters that you can connect with. But no, this all has to be about sex, race and gender, and that's probably why the film's flopping. You could argue that, you could argue that. I mean, just look at this article. Anyways, that's enough for this article. Terminator Dark Fate, probably not. <laughs> doing very well right now. So in other news, there is a movie coming out which looks very exciting and very good and it is called The Irishman. Now this film is directed by a man known as Martin Scorsese. Now here's a man who's directed some of my favorite movies and some undisputed heavyweight classics. The best being, I would say, Goodfellas, one of the best 
gangster film has ever made. He also directed Casino, which is pretty much the same thing. It's like a sequel or like a reimagining. It's a great film. And The Aviator, which is fucking amazing. He's got a litany of amazing movies. He's come back now and he's got Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, the two fucking dons from Goodfellas and Casino. He's got them back. Joe Pesci didn't want to come back, but he's brought him back. And Al Pacino, I believe, in the same fucking movie. Now, I was talking with my best mate about this. And we weren't sure about it because De Niro, since his heyday of gangster movies, he's been in a lot of stinkers, mate, some awful films. They're a bit old now. And apparently the reason why this film has a 150 million budget bankrolled by Netflix. How is how ironic is that? Not a major movie company. They turned it away. The reason why its budget is that much is because they use de-aging CGI to make the characters younger. Now, I read some rumors that it was a little bit distracting, but judging by the Metacritic scores, which are through the fucking roof, I think it's, it, I've just got a feeling that this is going to be a good movie. You can just feel it. It doesn't look like there's any social justice or weird political motivations behind the reviews. I think this is just a historical movie and people love it. Look at this Metacritic 94. There he is, Robert De Niro. So this one's coming out on Netflix and I think it's going to have a limited run in the cinema. You can see here on Wikipedia that the release date is September the 27th. God, that's... Okay, I don't know what that is, NYFF. Oh, that's, that, maybe that's in the cinema. And it's coming out on November the 1st in United States, which I'm guessing is on Netflix. So basically, by the time you see this video, in the next few days, you will be able to watch The Irishman if you have Netflix. And I would, I reckon this is gonna be sick. So trust me, if, you, if you've seen Goodfellas and Casino, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, go and watch Goodfellas right now. Fucking amazing film. And then get really excited for this movie, The Irishman. Can't wait to see that. Moving on to video game stuff. So there's a new Call of Duty out. Now, I just wanted to talk about this because Call of Duty, I can't be asked with that shit. I remember the original ones were a World War II simulator and then it, they did Modern Warfare, which is what made the series' popularity explode. Call of Duty was the first video gaming juggernaut. Call of Duty was the video game that pushed the video game industry beyond the movie industry and made it a more lucrative industry than movies. And there have been so many fucking sequels and it's just bottom of the barrel, same game after same game. I'm not interested in it at all. And the latest one's out and this is where you can smell the Met Metacritic bullshit. The gaming companies and, they're, and whoever they're working with for the PR and marketing, they've got the Metacritic, Metacritic journalists under their fucking thumbs. They've got them by the balls. So they always give good reviews because they want to stay on the good side of the developer, the publisher, whoever's involved. So they get more game reviews. They get invited to nice press events. They always give it a high score. What is interesting about this version of Call of Duty, and we're going to watch the trailer in a minute. I'm going to react to it. I've never seen it before. What's interesting about this version is... The Russians went sick on Metacritic. I can't remember what it's called, but you know when the user scores really heavily like outratio the journalist scores? That's what's happened on Metacritic. And it's been like review bombed by the Russians because apparently in this game, the Russians are put in a really, really bad light. So Russians have just invaded Metacritic and said what they think. I would have thought Russians wouldn't give a shit. They've always been the enemy in Western culture for so long. But now because of Trump, we're gonna make the Russians evil again. That's obviously the new kind of theme, global theme, global news theme. And as a result of all this madness, you are getting lots of angry Russians bombing the reviews, uh, the user score on Metacritic. So look at this, right? Call of Duty Modern Warfare, PlayStation 4, 83 average score by journalists, 3.4 average score by users based on 5,000 ratings, which is just insanely negative. So look at this. Here you can see positive 1,617 reviews, mixed 94, negative 3,466. So let's just read some random reviews and you're going to get a good feel for how pissed off the Russians are. Vladimir 161 says, racist, I will know... I will not buy the game anymore. You show my nation and my country as Nazis. I'm not sure that's a good Russian accent, but yeah, this guy's angry. He's obviously feeling that the portrayal of the Russian characters in the game is uh, a little bit prejudiced. Then we've got some guy writing in Russian. And let's keep going. There's lots of people just writing in Russian. 
Domsday01 says, maybe enough to use cliches from the last century about the ever evil Russians. Wolf, Wolf in Wild says, affects discrimination and Russophobia. When already ceased to make Russian bad guys, Russia was not when it was not a terrorist country and it was Russia that helped the world win the Second World War and not other countries. Thanks to Russia, now there is no fascism. I'm not sure about this, mate. I'm sure that Russia's been really cunty. They've done a lot of sketchy shit over the years, so I wouldn't absolve them of all blame across the you know geopolitical landscape. But yeah, it does seem that the Russians have been put in a really, really, really bad light <laughs> in this game. Everyone is so pissed off look at this guy Igrofil. he says what the fuck activision you've forgotten what is tolerance or you have forgotten that tolerance extends to the gaming field and what if our creators made such kind of game shit i can tell you you would yell like fucking bitches you would yell that your fucking nation was offended fuck out with that shit you just prove once again that you are shit the only way you can assert yourself is to make a game where you don't suck this guy's not quite right. If someone makes a game attacking America, social justice warriors will probably celebrate it because, again, oppressor versus oppressed narrative. These people generally in the media believe that America's a shitty place. So if someone made a game cussing America, they'd probably love it. They'd probably buy 10 copies. But all, all we can gather from this is social justice activism is just fucking everywhere. Now everyone's chiming in with their angry online mob on every fucking website, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Metacritic, and I just don't have time for this fucking petty bullshit. This just says that we've made it in life. We've made it in life. We've got to the stage where we have so little to worry about in terms of war or violence or disease that we've resorted to just look for stuff to complain about and spend our time bashing around a keyboard complaining about a video game. We've made it, people. Life is fucking good. Life is fucking sweet. Stop whining. Seriously. What other news have I got for you today, people? Well, that's pretty much it. Um, we could watch a video of Call of Duty, but I don't want to fuck up my streaming camera. That's going to make it go all jittery. So I think we will we will now talk a little bit about my life. Now I've got the news out of the way. I'll just tell you what I've been doing because some people know me from my music, um, probably from the song Ultrasound, which I made, which has more than 9 million views on YouTube. You can watch it. I'll put a link at the end of the video. So those people might be wondering what I'm doing. So I've got a little list here of stuff I've been doing. So one thing I've been learning is uh, just technological shit. I've been learning more about mastering, how to make music loud. And I think I really understand what I'm doing now. It turns out to make music really, really, really loud. It's actually not. It's definitely to do with this shit, all that stuff you see up there. But it's more to do. Well, it's also very much to do with software. I found a software program that is the magic bullet. It's the key to making music really loud. So now you are just thinking, to make music loud, you just turn up a volume knob, right? It's not that simple, I'm afraid. If it was that simple, there would be no mastering. Mastering being the final stage of polish before you release a song and the final stage where you can maximize the volume. To make something loud, you need to use all that processing stuff you just saw. But it turns out the real key to loudness in mastering is software programs. And it kind of makes sense because I don't know how computers work or any of that shit really when you get inside the box but computers can theoretically calculate how something should be in the future right and then try to make that happen analog hardware is is not making any calculations at all it's just a live current that's going into the into the hardware and so it all happens inside the computer the real magic i would say so i've been practicing my mastering mastering some of my own stuff and i've been mastering a song uh, in line with current mastering standards. Now, if you're into mastering or, or music production or the technical aspect of making music, you will have heard of the loudness wars. And this is basically a metaphorical dick measuring contest between mastering engineers to see who can make songs the loudest. Now, I think I understand why people do this now. It's a way that mastering engineers can passively stamp their authority and individ individuality and personality on a song. Because the mastering engineer is always behind the scenes, right? The artist gets all the glory they master the artist's song, everyone enjoys it. No one knows who the fuck they are. But by making it really, really loud, they feel that they can get a little bit of that mojo from the artist, from the song. And I get it. And I kind of like doing that myself. The louder you make a song, the more you have to cut shit away. You've got to take out a lot of bass in order to make it loud because there's so much super energy in the low frequencies that you need to cut it out to maximize the loudness. So I've kind of been doing that. 
and it is quite fun. So I'm, I'm really getting into mastering. It's a, it's good crack, but it takes days and days and days and days. If you're semi-pro, I guess I call myself semi-pro now, but to be a pro, you have to dedicate your life to it. And I've got other things to do. So I think I'll, I'll just keep going with that. Other things, music. So I've got a song coming out on November the 1st called Off World. I'll put the link at the end of the video again. Drum and bass song, check it out. It's got a few features from a few prominent um, SoundCloud entities, people with like thousands, tens of thousands of followers. They liked it. They're going to put it up on their, or they're going to repost it on their channel. So Off World, it's drum and bass, no lyrics from me this time. But you can hear my mastering in action and it's a very hard hitting drum and bass song. Off World, check it out. That's been, uh, it took fucking forever to make, but I'm glad that's done. I'm also working on another song called Flash Step, which is a ninja song and it's big and it's bombastic and it's huge and it's like, oh, uh. my friend said it, it, it's, it, it felt like his vein was going to explode in his head when he listened to it. So that was a, a glowing endorsement from Mike Sparkett, if you're watching. Cheers, mate. So music's coming from me off world, November the 1st. And then in November, end of November, it will be Flash Step. And Flash Step is from my new album named Cake and Dog. All will be explained and revealed later. Other shit, it's the season of this fruit in Japan, and I'm sure I mentioned this on a previous Johnny Massacre show, it's either persimmon or persimmon. Persimmon sounds quite fancy, doesn't it? But I call it persimmon, mate. I don't know what the fuck these things are. Sometimes they're crispy, sometimes they're soft and juicy. There's many different levels for the persimmon. And fuck me, these things are great. It's the season of the persimmon in Japan. I'm fucking eating this on the daily. If you never have one of these, make sure you try it because these are sexy. It's the kind of fruit it's a little bit of an acquired taste. Not everyone likes it, but people that do like it fucking love it. They got a massive bowl full of persimmon fucking everywhere. So there's definitely something about this fruit. Other shit, I uh, read a book by Ben Shapiro. It's called um, The Right Side of History. Very interesting. The, the last two, three chapters were really awesome. That's when he got into the modern day politics and you can learn a lot from that. And it, he's talking about the meaning of life basically and he says it's four things he said it's about uh individual purpose communal purpose individual capacity and communal capacity so why you're here and why you're doing this for you and as a community and how much you can do it as an individual and a community and it it argues that everything good about the modern world i.e america the, the land of the free the global policeman uh the country that basically brought freedom to the world it came from Judeo-Christian culture and uh, the ancient Greek philosophical reason, or also known as telos. And telos, or I think it's teleology, is the philosophy that things' meaning is derived from their purpose. So a banana has a skin because it's meant to be peeled and be eaten, which is bullshit because it's actually the product of like generations of selective breeding. But the purpose of the banana is to is to be this kind of you know this portable fruit that keeps in good condition because it has a skin and then you're supposed to eat it and a, and i don't know what else could there be like uh you know an arrow is designed to be fired um a fucking yeah i'm struggling now but his point is life comes from christianity and judaism and reason and logic and he argues that in the book the first 75 percent there's a lot of history, a lot of dates. There's a lot of footnotes, so it's very well backed up. It's a little bit, I wouldn't say dull, but it's um, it's nowhere near as exciting as the last three chapters in the book. So if you're kind of interested in social justice and why everyone's so angry at the moment and why am I here and meaning and purpose, where does it all come from? It could be an interesting book. So for, after that, I started reading a book by Karl Marx, The Communist Manifesto, because for some reason, communism is really popular and I'm trying to understand why. Uh, mate, yeah, stay away from this socialism shit, trust me. If you want to go down the Karl Marx route, basically he says in the Communist Manifesto, you have to give up all your property. That's right, motherfucker. Everything you own, <laughs> you have to give it up. So if you're willing to give up all your land, all your property into the hands of people you've never met and trust them to do good things with it and not be corrupt, go right ahead, mate. So I'm reading that. And that's about it, really. And so that's it for today's Johnny Massacre show. I hope you liked it. I tried to give you a nice kind of snapshot of current pop culture and a little bit about my life. Uh, if you did enjoy it, make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell to get notified immediately as soon as my videos drop because that's what all those other cunts tell you to do. And 
I shall be seeing you, sunshine, on the next one. Laters.